Hey there folks and welcome back. Today we're talking about Green's Theorem, one of the most beautiful theorems from this part of the course and the second of our four fundamental theorems of vector calculus. To introduce this incredible result, I want you to think back to the fundamental theorem of calculus that you know from Calc 1 and Calc 2. We all know what the FTC says. It allows us to integrate a function little f over an interval from a to b. Specifically, it says that the value of our integral is equal to capital F at B minus capital F at A, where capital F is an antiderivative of little f. Okay, now I want you to think of the fundamental theorem of calculus slightly differently. Notice that on the left-hand side of our equation, capital F is being evaluated at A and B, the boundary points of our interval, right? A and B, the endpoints, are really the boundary of this interval. Whereas on the right-hand side, its derivative, little f, is being evaluated throughout the interval, right? That's what this integral is doing. It's sort of taking into account the values of little f throughout this interval. So the fundamental theorem is telling us that there's a connection between the values of our function on the boundary and the values of its derivative on the interior. If you've understood this, you're going to understand the core idea behind Green's theorem. Essentially, Green's theorem is a version of the fundamental theorem of calculus that applies to vector fields. We are going to see the precise statement of Green's theorem on the next slide, but for now, here's the result in brief. It says that if you're dealing with a vector field capital F with component functions P and Q, then you can compute the line integral of F along some crazy closed curve C, might look something like this, by instead computing the double integral of some sort of a derivative of f throughout the interior of the region. So again, we have a connection between the values of a function along the boundary and the values of some sort of a derivative of that function throughout the interior, just like the FTC. Okay, let's check out the precise statement. Okay, folks, here it is, the statement of Green's theorem. It looks a little bulky, but really we're just listing out some basic assumptions. So to start, we need a curve C that's simple, closed, piecewise smooth, and positively oriented. All right, what do all these words mean? Well, we know simple and closed, right? Simple means it doesn't cross itself, and closed means it starts and ends at the same points. Okay, that's easy enough. Piecewise smooth just means that the curve is nice and smooth, nice and differentiable, or it's made up of several such curves that are glued together. This is not really a big deal. Uh, finally is positively oriented, which is likely a term you haven't heard before. Positively oriented just means that if we put a little man on our curve and we ask him to walk around in the direction of the arrows, then the inside of our region is always to his left. If he were to walk in the other direction, you can see that the region D would be on his right. That's negative orientation. Now the orientation here is very important. After all, if we compute a line integral of some vector field F along this curve C, we're really measuring the amount of work done by our vector field in pushing a particle along the curve. In some places, that work might be positive. The vector field is pushing the particle in the correct direction. But in other places, the work might be negative. The vector field is trying to move the particle backwards. If we were to suddenly switch orientation and have C moving in the other direction, then we would be computing the line integral along the curve minus C, right? The curve C moving in the other way. All of the positive work that we had before is now going to switch to negative work. And all of our negative work is going to switch to positive work. So the value of the line integral now is the negative of what it was before. If you switch direction when calculating the line integral of a vector field, you're going to get the same answer multiplied by minus 1. This was not the case for line integrals over scalar fields. Okay, so orientation is important, and we need our curve to be simple, closed, piecewise smooth, and positively oriented. In addition to our curve, we also need a vector field. We're going to assume that our vector field has component functions p and q with nice continuous partial derivatives on an open region containing d. All this means is that we're imagining a slightly larger set where our partial derivatives are nice and continuous, but in our course the partial derivatives will often be continuous everywhere, so this isn't a huge obstruction. 
Okay, if all of this is true, then Green's theorem says, well, exactly what we had on the last slide. The line integral along C of P dx plus Q dy, which as we saw in an earlier video is really the same, another way of writing the line integral along C of F dot dr, this line integral is equal to the double integral throughout the region D of this derivative function partial q by partial x minus partial p by partial y. I know it looks a little scary, but once we try an example, you'll really understand what's going on. Before moving on, however, I'd like to make an important comment. We've already generalized the fundamental theorem of calculus in one way to the fundamental theorem for line integrals. Now we're generalizing it in a different way to get Green's theorem. So how do these generalizations compare? Well, first of all, the fundamental theorem for line integrals only applies to conservative vector fields. Green's theorem does not include that assumption. So Green's theorem is a bit more general in that regard. However, Green's theorem only applies to curves that are closed, right? Closed and satisfying these other assumptions. The fundamental theorem for line integrals applies to curves that are not closed. If you happen to be working with a conservative vector field over a closed curve C, well then both theorems apply. According to the fundamental theorem of line integrals, the integral along that curve would be zero. We saw that in a previous video. If the curve is closed and the vector field is conservative, the fundamental theorem says the line integral is zero. Green's theorem says the same thing. If the field is conservative, then partial Q by partial X is equal to partial P by partial Y. That's our component test. So here we're integrating the zero function. Our line integral according to Green's theorem also evaluates to zero. Okay, let's check out an example. Suppose that we're trying to evaluate this line integral. The line integral along C of x minus y dx plus x dy, where here C is the path from one zero to minus one zero along the upper half of the unit circle followed by the straight line segment from minus one zero to one zero. So C is this path right here. We start at one zero, we follow the unit circle to minus one zero, and then we take this straight line segment back home. We are trying to calculate the line integral of F along the curve C, where here F is the vector field with components X minus Y and X. It's this vector field you see here. Now we actually solved an almost identical problem to this one in our example video on line integrals of vector fields. So I'm gonna start by reminding you of what we did there, and then I'll show you how to solve this problem using Green's theorem. Okay, if we didn't know Green's theorem, this is how we would have to solve the problem. We would probably start by checking if our vector field is conservative, right? Because then we can use the fundamental theorem for line integrals. But here it's not too hard to see that our vector field is not conservative. After all, the partial of q with respect to x is 1, whereas the partial of p with respect to y is minus 1. So it fails the component test, it's not conservative, and we can't use the fundamental theorem. So instead, we're going to have to compute this line integral by definition. We start by finding a parametrization for the curve c. And in order to do that, I'm really going to break this up into two curves. c1 is going to be the curve along the upper arc of the unit circle, and C2 is gonna be this straight line segment. The parametrizations for these curves are shown here. And again, we found these parametrizations in an earlier video. Our line integral is then given by the integral along C1 of F dot, the derivative of my first parametrization DT, plus the integral along C2 of F dot, the derivative of my second parametrization DT. If you replace x and y with the descriptions from both parametrizations, you're gonna get some hideous expression like this. And we could expand it out and we can integrate and it would be a lot of work, but in the end, we would get an answer of pi. Ugh, long, gross computation. Instead, let me show you a different way. Notice that the curve we're working with, c, is simple. It doesn't intersect itself except at the end point. It's closed, the starting point and ending point are the same. It's piecewise smooth. It's made up of two smooth curves joined together. And it's positively oriented. If we imagine a little man walking along this curve in the direction of the arrows, 
the interior of the region, which maybe we'll call D, is always to his left. Ah, simple, closed, piecewise smooth, positively oriented. Green's theorem applies. According to Green's theorem, this line integral that we're trying to compute is the same as the double integral along the inside of the region of partial q by partial x minus partial p by partial y. Ah, well, partial q by partial x is 1, and partial p by partial y is minus 1. So this is really the double integral throughout this region of 2 dA. But it's not too hard to integrate over this region. We can simply switch to polar coordinates. We have the integral from 0 to pi of the integral from 0 to 1 of 2 times r dr d theta. Our theta integral will evaluate to pi, and an antiderivative for the r integral is r squared. We evaluate from 0 to 1, and we get a final answer of pi. And that's the whole computation. So between the method on the last slide and Green's theorem, I'll let you decide. Which method do you prefer?